Hi, I'm Jim Smyrniotopoulos, and we're going to be talking about the differential diagnosis of posterior fossa masses. I have no relevant financial disclosures to report, and the material presented here are my own views and don't represent those of the National Library of Medicine. Occasionally, you'll see names on the MedPix slides, and these are the case contributor, not the patient's name. MedPix is an open access online radiology teaching file. I've been through airport security so many times they recognize me, and as I like to say, I'm from the government and I'm here to help. Our learning objectives are to identify extraaxial location of masses, to distinguish schwannoma from meningioma, and to describe the imaging features that distinguish epidermoid inclusion cysts from other posterior fossa masses. Let's begin by talking about extraaxial lesions in the cerebellopontine angle cistern of the posterior fossa. Posterior fossa lesions may be extraaxial, as we're going to begin with. They may be intraaxial involving the pons, such as diffuse midline glioma, and also demyelinating disease and vascular disease. And they may be intraaxial in the cerebellum, such as pilocytic astrocytoma, medulloblastoma, ependymoma, and hemangioblastoma. Here are six images of posterior fossa lesions. As we go through this seminar, we're going to identify the imaging characteristics that allow us to diagnose each one of these six imaging presentations. When we think about triangulation of posterior fossa masses, again, the extraaxial lesions are most commonly schwannomas, meningiomas, and epidermoid inclusion cysts. Intrinsic lesions of the pons may be diffuse midline glioma, formerly called diffuse intrinsic or diffuse infiltrating pontine glioma. Lesions that are in the cerebellar hemisphere that are fluid secreting, especially if they have an enhancing neural nodule, are going to be pilocytic astrocytomas in children or hemangioblastomas in adult patients. Lesions presenting inside the fourth ventricle are likely to be ependymoma, but sometimes they are medulloblastoma. Medulloblastomas can also arise in the cerebellar hemispheres and in the vermis. So let's start talking about schwannomas. Schwannomas are going to be the most common non-glial tumor and the most common extraaxial tumor. They're going to arise from precursor Schwann cells that form the myelin sheath for the peripheral portions of the cranial nerves. The central portions of the cranial nerves have oligodendrocytes producing their myelin sheath, and the first and second cranial nerves are actually white matter tracts that have oligodendrocytes throughout. The trigeminal nerve exits the pons and heads towards Meckel's cave and the cavernous sinus where we have the Gasserian uh, semilunar or trigeminal ganglion. And the seventh and eighth nerves travel obliquely into the internal auditory canal. The classic uh, anatomy that we want to see here, looking at the posterior fossa on this heavily weighted image, this could be a fiesta sequence or a cis sequence. We can see the sigmoid sinuses. We can see the cochlea, again named for its shape resembling a snail. We can see the a cochlear portion of the eighth nerve heading into the center of the snail, into the medialis. We can also see the vestibule, the transverse lateral or horizontal semicircular canal, and the basal turn of the cochlea on the opposite side. We can see that there is CSF inside of the internal auditory canal, and we can see that the uh, cranial nerves are entering through that CSF space into the IAC. If we were to look into the internal auditory canal from the position of the cerebellopontine angle cistern, we would see that it's divided into four quadrants by Bill's bar and the horizontal transverse cristofalsiformis. In the anterior superior quadrant of the IAC is the facial of the seventh nerve. In the anterior inferior portion, we have the cochlear auditory portion of the eighth nerve. And in the posterior half of the IAC, we have the superior and inferior divisions of the vestibular nerve. Remember, when something is called superior inferior, the structures lie one over the other. And when things are uh, distributed side by side, they're going to be medial and lateral or medial, median, and lateral. You can easily remember this orientation by thinking about seven up and coke down as the anatomy in the anterior half of the IAC, and the posterior half must contain the superior and inferior vestibular nerve, one right over the other.
So the differential diagnosis for cerebellar pontine angle masses includes the possibility of having a schwannoma, having a vascular lesion like an aneurysm or having an arachnoid cyst, having a meningioma or metastatic disease, or having an epidermoid inclusion cyst, or perhaps a pendymoma and chorid plexus papilloma. And although those latter two lesions arise inside the lumen of the ventricle, they oftentimes follow the flow of CSF out into the lateral recess and through the lateral foramen of Lushka into the cerebellopontine angle cistern. So we always give this same differential diagnosis for a cerebellopontine angle mass. In terms of the demographics, the most common CPA mass is going to be a schwannoma, more commonly arising from the eighth nerve than the trigeminal in humans, but in dogs and cats, more commonly arising from the trigeminal nerve. The second most common mass is going to be the meningioma, which should be broad based against an adjacent dural surface, such as the tentorium or the petrus dura. And the third most common lesion is going to be my favorite diagnostic category, which is other. And the top dog in that category is going to be the epidermoid inclusion cyst. But again, you can have mets and aneurysms. You can have the gliomas. You can have arachnoid cyst. You can have the rare and exotic cyst adenoma of endolymphatic sac origin that may or may not be associated with von Hippel-Lindau disease, and you can have other lesions such as a glomus tumor. If we look at this cartoon of the posterior fossa, we can see that commonly we illustrate the schwannoma as a rounded mass in the cerebellopontine angle cistern. But in actual fact, the vestibular schwannoma always arises inside of the IAC because the cisternal segment of the nerve has oligodendrocytes. And since the tumor is arising from Schwann cells, most likely, it's going to arise from the intracanalicular portion of the IAC. We want to remember that schwannomas tend to enhance very avidly, that schwannomas that are small, less than 20 millimeters, tend to be homogeneous, but that schwannomas that are older undergo benign cystic generation, and they are going to become heterogeneous. So we commonly see the presence of intracanalicular schwannomas, and intracanalicular schwannomas are typically arising from the apex of the internal auditory canal. In fact, it's been suggested that schwannomas tend to arise from scarpus ganglion, the sensory ganglion, for the cochlear portion of the eighth nerve. Now, the tumors tend to grow out of the IAC and into the cerebellopontine angle cistern. In the past, it was described that none of the cranial nerves normally enhanced. It was then identified in the early days of MR that the petrous portion of the seventh nerve in the facial canal may demonstrate contrast in Hampson in about three quarters of cases. This is probably not due to a breakdown in the blood nerve barrier, but is actually due to adjacent perineural vessels or a plexus. Facial nerve enhancement can be bilateral, but may be asymmetric in 70% of cases, but there should not be enlargement nor a mass. In a similar way, thin linear enhancement near the apex of the IAC can be normal, also thought to be due to perineural vessels or a plexus, but there should not be nodular enhancement or enlargement of the nerve in a normal patient. The literature suggesting that schwannomas arise from the sensory ganglion is presented here from 2012. Uh, there was a careful review of the localization at surgery and on imaging of 372 patients with schwannoma, and the vast majority of them, more than 90%, seem to be co-located with the sensory ganglia. The vestibular or scarpus ganglion, the cochlear or spiral ganglion, the facial or geniculate ganglion, uh, etc. Again, if we review the anatomy, we can see here in this uh, cryo section that the cisternal segment of the seventh and eighth nerves is going to be populated by oligodendrocytes. It's only the intracanalicular portion of the nerves that have the progenitor Schwann cells, but the tumor rapidly grows out of the IAC into the cerebellopontine angle cistern. So we can see here a classic version of a schwannoma involving the canal, but most of the bulk of the mass is in the cistern. This has been incorrectly described as the tumor arising in the cistern and growing back into the IAC, when in actual fact, it's exactly the opposite of that scenario. So schwannomas represent 5 to 10% of all CNS tumors. They're benign, slowly growing. They have a slight female predilection for the intracranial presentation and a male predilection for spinal schwannomas. 
If you have the germline mutation for NF2 and the long arm of chromosome 22, the tumor may present uh, in the second uh, decade or in the third and fourth decades. Sporadic schwannomas, which are usually solitary, tend to present in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. Schwannomas most commonly arise from sensory nerves and not from motor nerves. Again, that seems to go along with the notion that they're related to the sensory ganglion. The uh, intraspinal schwannomas tend to be dorsal for the same reason, and the majority are going to be sporadic. So again, the schwannoma begins as an intracanalicular mass. The tumor can rapidly grow out of the IAC and into the cerebellopontine angle cistern, creating the uh, imaging appearance that the tumor is actually arising in the cistern. We can also see that the portion of the tumor inside the IAC has caused a cone shape or flared enlargement of the lumen of the IAC and that there's no CSF within the IAC. If we look at this shape, it looks like an ice cream cone. And just as a reminder, if you buy three scoops of ice cream at Ben & Jerry's on a warm day, you might pay $7.78 for that. But you want to make sure that they pack the ice cream into the cone. Otherwise, as the ice cream softens, those expensive three scoops are going to fall out of the cone. So always look for the intracanalicular portion of the schwannoma. And that's what you should see if it really is arising in the IAC. So here's another example of a vestibular schwannoma, a relatively large cerebral angle mass. This gross picture is from a different patient. We can outline the vertebral and the basilar arteries, but we see a large, relatively sharply demarcated, relatively spherical lesion in the cerebral angle cistern. This is a different patient, again, illustrating that the older lesions, which uh, are going to be larger, tend to become heterogeneous. They show avid contrast enhancement. And again, if we compare side to side, the patient's left internal auditory canal is enlarged compared to the right side. This is a patient who has a young schwannoma. Again, there's tumor inside the canal, inside the cone, as well as in the cistern. And this is a patient that has a larger schwannoma, and big things are old things, and old things degenerate. In fact, our bodies were only designed to last about 40 years. After age 40, the eyes go, the ears go, and the knees go. And I get emails periodically reminding me that certain other body parts may need medicinal attention. So this is not necrosis, this is benign cystic degeneration. This is another example here of a large cerebral angle mass that has become heterogeneous. We can see comparing side by side that this time the right internal auditory canal contains a soft tissue mass instead of CSF. We can also see that the lesion uh, is very, very lobulated. In this particular case, again, it's heterogeneous and it's associated with trapping of fluid inside the mastoid air cells, which are no longer aerated. Again, the lesion here is clearly involving the internal auditory canal. We can also have trigeminal schwannomas. These lesions are oftentimes bilobed. There's one lobe inside the cavernous sinus, a second lobe in the posterior fossa in the cerebellopontine angle cistern. The tumor may be larger in one location versus the other. Uh, in this particular example here, it looks largely fluid-like in the posterior fossa, and that might be the oldest portion of the lesion in this example. The central constriction or wasting may be due to the dural reflections forming the margins of Meckel's canal. And again here, a bilobed heterogeneous lesion uh, involving the cavernous sinus and involving the posterior fossa with a fluid-like portion in the posterior fossa. This is a patient that has a neurofibromatosis type 2, and we can see that there are bilateral cerebellopontine angle masses, and the MR is from a different patient who also has that same chromosome 22 germline mutation that gives us multiple inherited schwannomas, meningiomas, and ependymomas, which is why some people call NF2 the Miss Me syndrome. This is another patient with NF2. We can see that there is a very large uh, posterior fossa mass on the left, a smaller posterior fossa mass on the right, and a third schwannoma involving a cavernous sinus arising from the trigeminal nerve. Just as a reminder, the lateral margins of the cavernous sinus should be straight or slightly concave facing the temporal lobe, and when they're bulging convex laterally, you have to consider the differential diagnosis for a cavernous sinus mass lesion.
Let's now look at the second most common lesion in the cerebellar pontine angle cistern, which is the meningioma. Meningiomas arise from the arachnoid. The arachnoid is attached to the dura, so the tumor is going to be attached to the dura. There typically is a broad base of dural attachment for meningiomas, and the shape tends to be that of a hemisphere rather than the shape of a rounded mass or a spherical lesion. When the lesion is a meningioma, the internal auditory canal tends to be of normal size. It has no reason to be enlarged. The tumor is usually a hemisphere. Meningiomas tend to remain homogeneous regardless of their age or their size. Hyperostosis is seen in uh, 40 to 70 percent of meningiomas, and meningiomas almost invariably have a dural tail in as many as 90 percent to 95 percent. If we look at this uh, pair of images on a petrous meningioma in the era of computed tomography, uh, it was sometimes difficult to identify that there was hyperostosis, but you can see here with bone windows that the bone is bulging towards the lesion. And looking at it the new way, if you look carefully at the MR, you can see that the hypointensity of the petrous bone is also rounded and convex, bulging towards the tumor. So an intradural soft tissue mass that's associated with overlying bony hyperostosis is almost invariably going to be a meningioma. So meningiomas, again, can be attached to the tentorium or the petrous bone itself. They tend to be relatively homogeneous lesions. This beautiful example from Tom Natick illustrates how the tumor is attached to the dura of the tentorium and that it roughly has the shape of a hemispherical lesion. The next lesion to talk about it in the posterior fossa cerebellar pontine angle cistern are the cystic lesions. The, this cerebellar pontine angle mass does not show contrast enhancement because this is an epidermoid inclusion cyst. Epidermoid inclusion cysts consist of a living epithelial lesion that produces squamous epithelium. The contents of the cysts are dead skin flakes, desquamated squamous epithelium that accumulates over decades. Because the contents of the cyst are going to be dead material, there's no mechanism for contrast enhancement. Epidermoid inclusion cysts are notorious for having a wavy or an undulating margin. The lesion may actually surround the basilar artery and the other vessels and nerves in the cerebellar pontine angle cistern, which can make resection much more difficult. So the lesion tends to have an undulating or a wavy margin, as illustrated here. Epidermoid inclusion cysts can mimic the attenuation on CT and the signal intensity on MR of an arachnoid cyst, but if you look carefully, you should see, number one, that the signal intensity is nearly but not identical to CSF. Number two, there is no contrast enhancement. And number three, careful inspection may reveal that there are thin linear structures, wispy structures, inside the epidermoid inclusion cyst that represent the layers upon layer upon layer of desquamated squamous epithelium. Of course, the go-to image on MR is going to be the diffusion weighted image, because unlike an arachnoid cyst, epidermoid inclusion cysts are going to have restricted diffusion. They're going to be very bright on DWI, and they're going to have low signal on the ADC map. What we have in an epidermoid inclusion cyst is this uh, pearly appearance here, this mother of pearl appearance, this very shiny appearance. We can see here that the posterior fossa epidermoid inclusion cyst can snake through the tentorial hiatus and present in both the middle fossa, supertentorially, and in the posterior fossa. That dancing arrow is showing us the living part of the lesion, which is the squamous epithelium, and the lumen itself is full of all of these dead skin flakes, these very, very thin linear structures, which is dry, waxy, flaky keratin, sort of like an onion skin. Sometimes epidermoid inclusion cysts will form a keratin pearl, similar to the way you get a pearl inside of an oyster shell. So remember when you're thinking about an epidermoid that you should see with careful inspection some of these linear structures that represent the contents of the epidermoid inclusion cysts.
As mentioned earlier, the epidermoid inclusion cyst is soft and fluctuant, can pass through the tentorial hiatus. It may involve the middle fossa as well as the posterior fossa illustrated here on this T1-weighted image and the corresponding flare image in the coronal plane. In comparing epidermoids and arachnoid cysts, the most common location for the arachnoid cyst is the middle fossa. As mentioned, the epidermoid is in the cerebellopontine angle cistern. The arachnoid cyst is usually convex all the way around its margin. It should be nearly identical to CSF and no contrast enhancement. We should not see any internal structure in an arachnoid cyst. So epidermoids can be considered to be a dirty arachnoid cyst, but, but don't even say that because it's a totally different kind uh, of lesion with different epithelial lining. I wanted to show you an arachnoid cyst in the same location. And this again is almost identical to CSF and signal intensity. It has a rounded convex margin and the arachnoid cyst is not going to insinuate and wrap itself around the vessels and nerves in the cerebellopontine angle cisterns. As illustrated here on the T2 weighted image, there is less motion dephasing of CSF inside the cyst. So sometimes it is slightly brighter than the CSF in the greater subarachnoid space. The next thing we want to talk about are intraaxial lesions in the posterior fossa. We're going to start out with a lesion that causes enlargement and expansion of the brainstem, what we used to call brainstem gliomas, but we're smarter than that. They're not just gliomas, they're almost always astrocytomas. They're typically diffuse astrocytomas. And we now know that these are caused by a distinctive mutation that is very different from what we see in supertentorial astrocytomas. It's a histone mutation, classically an H3K27M mutation. So the pons itself is expanded by the diffuse infiltration. And oftentimes it is a homogeneous expansion because there is non-destructive infiltration of neoplastic astrocyte cells. So diffuse midline glioma presents in children and young adults. They tend to involve midline structures including the brainstem or the pons as we just saw, the cervical spinal cord, but they can also involve the hypothalamus and the thalamus. Regardless of their histology, bland or anaplastic, they have a very poor prognosis and about one third of them will have CSF spread. In the old days, the pathologist would grade the histology of a pontine glioma as being grade 2, 3, or 4 diffuse astrocytoma, but they're now all considered to be grade 4 regardless of their histologic appearance. Diffuse midline glioma is often recognized as a relatively amorphous or homogeneous expansile lesion involving the brainstem, most commonly the pons. In this example, there is no contrast enhancement at all of the lesion, and the dorsal portion of the brainstem is convex and encroaching on the lumen of the fourth ventricle. If we look at the axial image, we can see that the lesion is growing ventrally and partially surrounds the flow void for the basal artery. This is the typical appearance of a diffuse midline glioma, H3K27M histone mutation. We want to remember that brainstem gliomas are primarily in the pons. They can also involve the cervical medullary junction. The vast majority of them are going to be this diffuse midline glioma group with the histone mutation. But there is also a focal lesion that can involve uh, the brainstem. And this is commonly a dorsally exophytic pilocytic astrocytoma with its WHO grade one, and is seen almost exclusively in children. These are two different patients, but both of them illustrate the lesion causing diffuse expansion of the brainstem, expansion of the pons, <clears throat> the midbrain, uh, and the medulla oblongata. Again, there is encroachment on the lumen of the fourth ventricle. The lesion is extending vertically through the brainstem because the infiltrating cells are following the vertical orientation of the corticospinal tracts. So diffuse midline glioma is fundamentally different from the adult gliomas. Uh, in the old-fashioned grading system, they were primarily grade 4, but we now know that they're all graded 4 if they have this histone mutation. The vast majority of the patients are under the age of 10. 
Most of them affect the pons. About one third have CSF spread at the time of diagnosis. The median survival is approximately 10 months and their survival is not related to their old fashioned WHO grading. These are the Kaplan-Meier survival curves showing us that that histone H3 mutation is associated with a very short survival. So the ponting glioma or diffuse midline glioma is notorious for expanding the brainstem, effacing the lateral portion of the posterior fossa, effacing the cerebellopontine angle cistern and growing ventrally around the basilar artery, which is what we see here in this example. In this beautiful gross photo, we see massive expansion of the volume of the middle cerebellar peduncles, which are the largest white matter tracts in the posterior fossa. The tumor can spread from side to side through these transversely oriented white matter tracts. So diffuse midline glioma, again, expansion of the pons, ventral growth that surrounds the flow void for the basilar artery. They can be relatively homogeneous. They can, but oftentimes do not show any contrast enhancement whatsoever, as seen in these six images here from a single case. We know that the imaging appearance can change over time. This is a biopsy WHO grade two diffuse ponting glioma before the H3 histone mutation was a tumor marker. And within six weeks of the biopsy, the tumor became floridly heterogeneous with abnormal contrast enhancement. The neurosurgeon was actually worried that he had irritated the tumor by doing the needle biopsy, causing it to have this malignant transformation. But in actual fact, it's the normal progression of the disease. The next thing we want to talk about for intraaxial intraventricular lesions is the medulloblastoma. Medulloblastomas actually subscribe several different subtypes which are defined by their molecular markers and now we know that there is some geographic correlation of which tumor markers represent which location for medulloblastoma. Medulloblastomas are composed of small round cells or carrot shaped cells that have a high nucleotide to plasmic ratio. Because they are small round blue cells, like other small round blue cell tumors, they tend to have a high attenuation on a non-contrast CT scan. They may show some element of restricted diffusion and they may be relatively hypo-intense on flare and T2 weighted MR imaging. The primary differential for a lesion involving the ventricle and the posterior fossa in a child is between medulloblastoma and ependymoma. Medulloblastomas tend to be rounded, centrally located masses. They may arise within the ventricle or within the vermis and grow into the ventricle or within the cerebellar hemisphere, secondarily growing into or encroaching on the lumen of the fourth ventricle. So a centrally located posterior fossa mass can be intraaxial, it can be intraventricular, it can be extending from the vermis into the ventricle, or it can be extending from the ventricle into the vermis. As a practical matter, however, tumors that arise within the ventricle tend to respect the ependymal lining of the ventricle, and they tend to stay within the ventricle. So involvement of the vermis and the ventricle at the same time is very suggestive of a lesion that began in the vermis and therefore not an ependymoma, but much more likely to be a medulloblastoma. So if we look here at these two beautiful sagittal images, the ependymoma is identified as a lesion within the lumen of the fourth ventricle, growing out of the fourth ventricle into the cisterna magna, and typically having a point of attachment to the dorsal portion of the brainstem. In contrast, this medulloblastoma is illustrated as a lesion in the vermis, and this particular example has not yet grown down to involve the fourth ventricle. If we were using the choroid plexus as a landmark, we would identify that the choroid plexus is displaced anterior and downward by most medulloblastomas, and the choroid plexus would be displaced posterior and superiorly by the ependymoma. However, we don't use that landmark on MR, but it's a great landmark to use on angiography. So again, looking at this cartoon, we have the margins of the fourth ventricle consisting of the floor of the ventricle being the brainstem, the anterior superior medullary vellum, and the posterior inferior medullary vellum. 
And if the lesion was arising from the cerebellum itself, it would displace the choroid plexus in one direction. If the lesion was arising within the lumen of the ventricle, which is where we find ependymomas, it would displace the choroid plexus in a different direction. So medulloblastomas tend to be relatively homogeneous lesions. Cyst and hemorrhage can occur, but they're relatively uncommon. About 75% are hyperattenuating on a non-contrast CT. They're highly cellular, small, round, blue cell tumors. And oftentimes, they're involving the posterior portion of the posterior fossa arising from the vermis or the cerebellar hemispheres. Just like this example here, a rounded, centrally located mass. Now, the ependymomas tend to be softer tumors, and while they may fill the lumen of the fourth ventricle, they tend to retain the triangular shape of the normal fourth ventricle. So again, on CT, about three quarters of them are going to show homogeneous hyperattenuation and involvement of the ventricle and the vermis at the same time is strongly suggestive of a medulloblastoma. Now, medulloblastomas are only one of several different types of CNS embryonal neoplasms, and we don't have time to talk about all the others during this discussion. Now, there are several different biomarker subtypes of medulloblastoma. And very sadly for the pathologist, all of these can have what is called a classic medulloblastoma histology. So normal light microscopy cannot distinguish between these different tumor marker subtypes. One of these tumor marker subtypes is associated with Turcotte syndrome. So the molecular markers have been layered on top of the histologic classification to give us new insight and information about these different types of medulloblastomas. The most common type of medulloblastoma is probably going to be the group four. Group three is also relatively common and group three has the worst prognosis. The best prognosis is the WINT or wingless medulloblastoma, and this is thought to arise from progenitor cells that are related to the embryology of the posterior fossa from the rhombic lips. This represents about 10% of all medulloblastomas, and it has a 90% five-year survival. This tumor tends to peak between 10 and 23 years. The sonic the hedgehog mutation, which represents a little bit less than 30% of medulloblastomas, has a good but intermediate prognosis. And this primarily occurs uh, in a bimodal distribution of infants under the age of four years and adults over the age of 16. This cartoon illustrates some of the demographic and survival differences, as well as location differences, between these four different medulloblastoma subtypes. Again, the wint tends to be a little bit ventral and lateral to the fourth ventricle. The sonic the hedgehog tends to be involving the cerebellar hemisphere. And the group three and the group four tend to be in the vermis behind the fourth ventricle. If we compare again side by side the, these classic typical presentations for the wingless medulloblastoma and the sonic the hedgehog med medulloblastoma, we see how their location is different. And uh, about 70% or more of the wint medulloblastomas will involve the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle. I like to remember this by thinking that a W is actually like putting two Vs together and that the wint or wingless medulloblastoma tends to be ventral to the ventricle or involve the ventricle. So remember those two Vs, ventral and ventricle for the Wnt mutated medulloblastoma. Again, if we compare the Wnt to the sonic the hedgehog, the sonic the hedgehog is arising from embryologic uh, external granular cells, the Wnt from cells from the rhombic lips, and we have one lesion that is in the lumen of the ventricle and one lesion that is behind the lumen of the ventricle. So remember, we have this wingless and sonic the hedgehog flavors of medulloblastoma. So again, we have this small round blue cell tumor involving the cerebellar hemispheres, maybe secondarily involving the ventricle. And as a small round blue cell tumor, we would expect that it might have high attenuation on the plain CT and show restricted diffusion on the MR in a manner that is similar to the appearance of primary CNS lymphoma, which is also a small round blue cell tumor.
So again, these common flavors of medulloblastoma, the medulloblastoma type 3 and 4 don't have very specific imaging findings, but the Wnt and the Sonic the Hedgehog appear to have this characteristic presentation that we've just reviewed. The Wnt are ventral, and the Sonic the Hedgehog tend to involve the vermis and then only secondarily involve the lumen of the ventricle. The next entity that we're going to discuss is the ependymoma. The cell of origin for the ependymoma is thought to be the ependymal lining of the ventricular system, and these lesions typically grow almost exclusively within the ventricular lumen. For that reason, ependymomas are considered to be circumscribed gliomas rather than being diffuse gliomas. If we look here, the classic ependymoma is going to be presenting in the fourth ventricle in a child, sometimes in the lateral ventricle. We know that ependymomas can also be intraspinal intramedullary tumors. The fourth ventricular ependymoma will take on the shape of an enlarged fourth ventricle and oftentimes is going to have extensions into the lateral recess, which we see here bilaterally. We did see that a medulloblastoma wingless mutation can extend into one lateral recess, but Pendymomas tend to symmetrically fill the ventricle and involve both lateral recesses simultaneously. So the ependymoma is described as being a soft or plastic lesion that conforms to the shape of the fourth ventricle. It may have angular extensions through the lateral foramen of Lushka, the midline foramen of Majandi. They may crawl down the back of the medulla and the cervical spinal cord. They tend to be heterogeneous and they are likely to have fluid-like areas and chunks of calcification. And they are described as most commonly arising from the ependyma forming the floor of the ventricle rather than ependyma arising in the roof of the ventricle. So again, the ependymoma tends to enlarge the lumen of the fourth ventricle, sending out these processes of tumor, soft tumor extending out through the foramina of the fourth ventricle. We can see here in this beautiful uh, sagittal image that the triangular shape of the fourth ventricle is retained, but there is a tongue of tissue extending behind the medulla oblongata and into the big cistern, the cisterna magna. Again, in a different example here, we see the lateral wings of the tumor and we see a tongue of tissue extending down into the foramen magnum. And here is yet another example showing a posterior fossa heterogeneously enhancing mass with a very prominent extension through the midline and through the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle. The neurosurgeon said that most of the tumor bulk was actually out laterally in the cerebellopontine angle cistern. Again, another gross picture of an ependymoma illustrating how the tumor fills and expands the lumen of the fourth ventricle and then extends processes out through the outlets of the fourth ventricle in the midline as well as laterally. So it is a circumscribed glioma, but obviously we all know that they can cause CSF dissemination and carcinomatous meningitis. Ependymomas are diagnosed histologically by the formation of these perivascular structures. These are not neuronal rosettes. They're called pseudorosettes. The cells are arranged in a circle with cellular processes heading down towards the lumen. The lumen in this example here contains some erythrocytes. I can only imagine that neuropathologists are intensely religious people and that on Sunday mornings when they were in the cathedral, they would look at the rose window and they would identify all of these structures arranged in a circle around a central area. And they figured that that looked just like the arrangement of the ependymal glial cells surrounding a vessel and forming these perivascular pseudo rosettes.
Let's now turn our attention to the last couple of entities that we wish to discuss, the intraaxial lesions associated with fluid secretion, the pilocytic astrocytoma, and the hemangioblastoma. Remember to call these fluid secreting lesions and not cystic lesions, because the definition of a cyst is a fluid-filled space lined by an epithelium. And this fluid is typically exophytic to the neoplastic component of the lesion itself. So the pilocytic astrocytoma is classically described as having a solid enhancing nodular lesion and then a peripheral or exophytic fluid collection. There may or may not be enhancement in the wall around the fluid filled space. The fluid contains protein and so it's not identical to CSF. On CT, the nodule may have low attenuation. It may calcify in up to 25% of examples. And the nodule itself tends to have slightly increased diffusion because it contains microcysts. We typically don't identify any significant vascularity in a pilocytic astrocytoma. The peak age of presentation tends to be at the margin between the first and second decade, between nine and approximately 12 years of age. So the pilocytic astrocytoma tends to be seen as a biphasic lesion having both a fluid area and a solid area. The contrast enhancement tends to be limited to the solid portion of the lesion, although in some examples you can see an irregular or heterogeneous nodule and some peripheral enhancement around the wall of the fluid-filled space. We notice here that the fluid has a different signal intensity compared to CSF because it has a very, very high protein concentration. There is no lining here, and that's why there is no contrast enhancement. So again, in the sagittal image here, we can see the biphasic lesion, we can see the solid nodule with enhancement, and we can see the fluid-filled portion uh, that has in some areas some curvilinear enhancement around the outside. We next want to talk about the hemangioblastoma, another fluid secreting tumor. It also occurs and presents in the posterior fossa in the cerebellar hemisphere, but in a different age group. It tends to present in adult patients at, at the end of the second decade and during the third and the fourth decades. So hemangioblastomas are also fluid secreting tumors. They may be related to the chromosome 3 mutation that produces von Hippel-Lindau disease. In VHL, the patients tend to have multiple hemangioblastomas. And the hemangioblastoma is a hypervascular lesion, and we're oftentimes able to identify flow voids and blood products related to the nodule in these tumors. So this is an example of a hemangioblastoma, a middle-aged adult patient. We can see that there is a solid nodule with enhancement, a fluid component that is not surrounded or rimmed by contrast enhancement. If we look at this angiogram here, we can see a dense tumor blush in the nodule. We can see a non-enhancing lesion displacing the vascular structures, the normal vessels away from it, and that's the fluid which is invisible on the angiogram. We can see that there is a single dilated feeding artery, and we can also see that there is a single draining vein. Sometimes there's a couple of each of these, but most of the lesion is the fluid which doesn't have a tumor blush and doesn't have any contrast enhancement. If we want to compare these posterior fossa cerebellar fluid secreting tumors, we can compare side by side what we see on imaging in hemangioblastomas and pilocytic astrocytomas. The nodule in a hemangioblastoma may be in some cases hyperattenuating on a CT. Uh, it may not show increased diffusion on MR, but most importantly, the nodule enhances and the nodule shows increased perfusion on the MR perfusion weighted image. In contrast to that, the pilocytic astrocytoma tends to be cold on the perfusion weighted image. And even though it shows contrast enhancement, the enhancement in a pilocytic is due to capillary permeability and is not due to an increase in the number of vessels within the tumor. So the cold nodule is the pilocytic and the hot nodule is going to be the hemangio. Blastoma. So comparing them side by side, hemangioblastomas occur in older patients. Hemangioblastomas have angiographically visible vessels. Hemangioblastomas don't have calcification. The perfusion is hot on the hemangioblastoma. The angiogram is positive in the hemangioblastoma.
hemangioblastoma, and hemangioblastomas may be associated with von Hippel-Lindau disease. So comparing them side by side, although they both have contrast enhancement and fluid, they're very, very different on perfusion-weighted imaging. So we've come towards the end of the time that we have for this discussion of posterior fossa masses. Let's review what we've discussed. Extraaxial lesions are most common in the cerebellar pontine angle cistern and include schwannomas that involve the IAC, meningiomas that are hemispheric, and non-enhancing epidermoid inclusion cysts. We discussed the diffuse midline glioma, which has the histone mutation and causes expansion of the volume of the brainstem that obliterates the cerebellar pontine angle cisterns and may grow ventrally to surround the basilar artery. Medulloblastomas are much more commonly going to be posterior or lateral to the fourth ventricle. The fluid secreting tumors we just talked about, the pilocytic astrocytoma in children and the hemangioblastoma in adult patients, and the ependymoma that tends to fill the lumen of the ventricle but follow the flow of CSF into the lateral recesses in the midline foramen of Majandi, oftentimes extending out of the fourth ventricle and into the cisterna magna. Reviewing the images that we started with, a lesion involving the CPA and the IAC at the same time, the vestibular schwannoma, the hemispheric lesion attached to the tentorium, the meningioma, the expansion of the brainstem surrounding the basilar artery, the diffuse midline glioma, the fluid lesion, the hemangioblastoma or pilocytic astrocytoma, the centrally located lesion, composed of small round blue cells, the medulloblastoma, and the lesion filling the fourth ventricle and extending into the lateral recesses, the ependymoma. I want to stop now and thank you for your very, very kind attention.